So, just as we are nearing the end of this second day of the Olympia Forum, I am quite pleased to welcome well, two representatives of one of the big white hopes that Greece has, meaning the EIB. The EIB is considered as a benevolent institution, which is not exactly the case for all EU institutions. And joining us from abroad, because the COVID has made it very difficult to communicate with each other from close up, we have Janos Ondracek, who is an energy economist, energiakos economologos potheto elinika, and Andrea Pina, who is senior advisor for climate change, both from the EIB. And within 15 minutes or so, they are called up to explain to us how the EIB is going to support, meaning in fact to finance, green, Greece's green transition. Now then, you have just 15 minutes. We are supposed to be holding a conversation, but these things from uh, this kind of distance is not a very easy situation. So I will put beforehand on your table a number of questions, or rather of issues, such as what in fact is financeable and what is not? Because we talk about the green transition of the Greek economy and we hope that we would have a number of natural gas projects. Is that green enough or not? Is it financeable or not? Then again, how, how expensive or how low cost is the EIB's funding? And how large can the EIB, the EIB's role be in order to coordinate financial packages? How accessible is the bank? In fact, I end up putting a major question on your table. Is the EIB well understood today, especially in financing energy and energy transition. You arrange between yourselves the way in, you, in which you present your presentation, and I hope you will be welcoming my intermediate comments or questions. Maybe Mr. Ondracek starts. Yes, Antonis, thank you very much indeed for, for starting off with a couple of questions that we try to actually answer by, by going through a small number of slides uh, because we have anticipated some of the questions that you are asking. And then uh, Andrea and I will, uh, to the extent that we haven't answered them through the slides, also, of course, answer them directly. So if we could pull up the first slide, please, um, from our presentation. So that's what we want to talk about, and that's exactly what your questions are about. So how can EIB and how does EIB already support Greece's green transition? Because we've been doing a lot of projects already in Greece. So if we go to the next slide, please. Next slide, please. So just a very, very short introduction to what EIB is because not everyone knows this uh, and maybe also not in the audience today. So EIB is the EU's uh, bank. It's owned by the member states of the European Union. It was founded at the same time as the EU was founded. Um, and it is a long-term lender to um, both the public sector and to private sector borrowers, supporting investments in infrastructure. And infrastructure means all kinds of things. It could be schools, it could be refugee camps, it could be uh, energy power projects, it could be uh, harbors, ports, and uh, airports, and so on and so forth. Uh, EIB is also the largest multilateral lender uh, in the world with around 60 billion, just above 60 billion of new lending every year. Most of that is always inside the EU because that's 
where our shareholders are, but a fair portion of it is also outside the EU in uh, countries in Africa and Caribbean, uh, Asia and so on. Um, EIB finance it's itself, and that's very important to know, we're not handing out su grants or subsidies, but we're really a bank. So whatever we hand out as a loan, we expect to see back with interest and of course the full capital returned. And we're funding ourselves on the capital markets. Uh, so we're not subsidized by taxpayers. Um, and in addition to the usual lending activities that we do, we also do what is called blending. So we're happy to work alongside donors uh, and um, grant uh, organizations such as the European Commission. So we're blending different sources of financing. And what's also important that goes to addressing uh, one of the questions that Antonis was, make, was asking, we're also advising uh, on uh, infrastructure projects. Um, for example, we have an active support role in many member states on public-private partnerships. So we advise to the extent that it's needed to make projects financeable or bankable. So that's a very short overview of what the EIB is. The next slide, please. Um, indeed, last year, our board uh, of uh, governors, our board of directors adopted the bank's climate bank roadmap, as it is called, which is to see the bank turn itself into Europe's climate bank. Uh, there's three headline targets uh, that we have essentially been given or given ourselves. One is to mobilize one trillion euros of Clima, uh, climate friendly, environmentally friendly investments by 2030, which is of course a, a significant amount of money. Uh, we're also trying to get more of our lending um, aligned with climate targets. So from the current 25 to 30% of all lending being green in a sense to 50% within the next five years. Um, and by the end of this year, and we're really at the moment in the midst of this process, we will be the first fully Paris aligned, i.e. aligned with the Paris Agreement on Climate uh, Mitigation, will be the first multilateral lender fully aligning itself with Paris by the end of this year. Um, and this is important to know, of course, because in turning ourselves into the EU's climate bank, um, we're actively looking to support EU member states in their own green transitions, because that's really where the focus of our work and our efforts is going to be in the next 10 years and obviously beyond. Next slide, please. The EU's Green Deal that's been talked about quite a lot already today and also just transition um, are, of course, um, the, the overarching framework, if you so wish, under which we also operate as an EU institution. So we're trying to work alongside the European Commission and member states in implementing and turning into reality the Green Deal in meeting the very challenging ambition uh, for the 2030 carbon reductions of uh, 20 uh, of sorry 55 percent or more uh, co2 reductions um, and how we do that um, is of course through the usual activities that we do which is lending and blending and advisory as i was saying but also by really integrating our own efforts with those of the commission and of member states and you see us here quite prominently in the invest eu context which is a continuation or meant to be the continuation of the uh, FC fund, the uh, Juncker plans uh, investment fund, um, but also through other activities. And some of that is of course still activities that are developing such as the just transition plans, which are not formalized yet by all member states. But once they are uh, formalized and have been approved in Brussels, then of course we will be coming up with ideas as to how we can support in that area as well. Next slide, please. Um, one very important element and maybe the first major step in, in turning ourselves into the EU's climate bank was the adoption of the new energy lending policy uh, in November last year. Um, and it has essentially three main strands um, that you'll see on this slide. One is that we'll phase out our support for fossil fuel projects. EIB was traditionally a lender to gas and oil projects for quite sizable uh, loan amounts also in, in all kinds of countries, um, will stop all of that or nearly all of that by the end of next year. Um, because we see really that the biggest benefit that we can offer as, uh, as a lender, um, as a policy driven bank is to support everything that's new and innovative and that's really aligned with uh, climate targets, which means we'll focus our efforts on energy efficiency uh, energy efficiency investments and de decarbonization in power sectors. 
that's uh, lending to uh, renewables, for example, lending to hydrogen projects, lending to storage projects, lending to grid infrastructure that supports the integration of intermittent renewables and so on and so forth. And the third very important strand is our engagement with member states and of course also our clients where we try to support really through a dialogue as much as possible the various efforts of our borrowers um, but also of member states in turning their own plans into a reality. And then the next and I think also already nearly final slide. Um, What's important to, to note is that EIB has been doing a lot of lending in the energy sector, but also, of course, in other infrastructure sectors increase uh, over the last years and also through the last economic crisis. Um, so we've always been there and we would like, of course, to continue doing projects in Greece and supporting projects in Greece and maybe even more in the future than in the past uh, as Greece moves from using lignite, um, for example, for power generation to cleaner technologies. We have the know-how and we have the financial firepower in a sense, of course, to support these projects and we'd like to do more of them. Um, I won't go into the details of the next two slides because we talk about them also in this, what is meant to be a dialogue. Um, so I'd say we go to the very last slide just very briefly with our contact details, but hopefully you'll also see them in a, in a handout. Um, now, maybe just going back to Antonis, your, your questions, and we can stop the, the presentation as such here um, to see our pictures again um, on what we can finance and what we can't finance. You mentioned gas, and I already gave the answer more or less, which is that gas we can't support, even though we see it as a transition fuel from uh, coal to even cleaner or clean sources of power. Um, but EIB has do you essentially do you ruled hear out me? financing gas. Yes. Yes. Uh, I tried to uh, introduce a further question. When you say that you will do a phase out, is it immediate? Is it total? Are there any windows open to try and shift from dirtier to cleaner, but not to clean forms? This is the background of my thinking about the natural gas transition. Yeah, and it is a very fair question that's Andrea, you want to take it? Go ahead. Uh, well, uh, I just wanted to, um, uh, yes, it is. I mean, you, you, you Janos, will, will, can answer, of course, that question as well. But uh, I just wanted to throw in the uh, fact that in July of this year, we did sign a loan providing uh, 125 million euros uh, of low cost finance, uh, you know, uh, to uh, Mitilineos. For the Agis Nicolaus, uh, 826 uh, megawatts of CCGT power plant. Now, this, as Janos was saying, unfortunately, or fortunately, depending on uh, who you ask, I guess, uh, will probably be our last uh, CCGT combined uh, cycle gas turbine um, gas project in Greece, perhaps even in Europe. Maybe just to complement, indeed, uh, a so few projects that were still for uh, pipeline, pipelines. No possible participation we, to the financing we, of natural gas pipelines in the future. Indeed, no longer. We projects that were still on a list uh, of projects before the energy lending policy was approved and adopted uh, can still be financed if the, you know the final decision and the loan signature take place before the end of next year. But anything coming uh, in nowadays, we cannot do uh, any longer. Yeah. Background to this, and I tried to give it already a bit in the presentation, is that. Uh, even though we're a big lender, we of course also have limited funds. And the decision that was taken last year was to say, if we have these 65 billion to lend, and not all of it of course goes to, to a green uh, projects in a sense, um, the question was, where can we have, where can we generate the largest benefit in a sense? And that was seen to be in energy efficiency and renewables and also electricity grids and so on, rather than in supporting transition fuels that have their merits, of course, in transitioning from coal to, to uh, renewables, for example, or in even just supporting renewables by you know, providing backup capacity and so on. So clearly there's merits in, in gas plants. Um, but it was seen that EIB in itself wasn't 
in a position where it would add the largest benefit in a sense to um, support these projects. But there's of course other lenders available for gas projects also. And as long as they have their uh, a solid business case, you will find a lender for a gas plant for sure. So it was in the, in the end, it was a political decision, of course, and was very hotly debated also among our uh, our members, our our shareholders. Talking of political decisions and and on impact situa the impact situations, is the social dimension present in the EIB's uh, targets? If there is a, a not so profitable project going on rather marginal, but which is supposed or which is proven to have a large social cohesion dimension. Would this consideration play in the IB's decision-making process? Yes, we always also, when we appraise projects, when we look at them, we also consider social and environmental impacts. Um, they are very important for us to look at. So it's never only the cash flow, the bottom line of a project that plays a role. Of course, every project needs to be financially solid for us to support it as a, as a lender. Um, but it, the analysis never stops there. So if, for example, you have a project located in a region with high unemployment, this would be perceived as a and an added benefit for th for supporting such a project in, in, in such a region. Hmm. Perhaps, perhaps it's useful to say also that, um, as Janus was saying as well, uh, the European Investment Bank is really a partner um, of governments and corporations that uh, with which uh, we do the projects together. And it's important to say that uh, it's not just a bunch of bankers uh, and uh, financial analysts. We have our own uh, sector economists. We have our own uh, pool and body of uh, engineers. We have our social specialists, our environmental specialists, our climate change specialists. And we're really um, we're advisory specialists, of course. We really accompany uh, countries and corporations from A to Z, let's say, from the beginning to the end. Uh, the times of uh, preparing the project uh, to when the project has to be uh, disbursed. And that's very important also for the quality of the project. And yes, the social dimension, the, the environmental dimension, uh, the, the, the climate dimension is absolutely important. And if I may, because you um, asked a question about also how uh, sort of uh, cheap or expensive, how uh, large or uh, small, and how uh, uh, sort of accessible or non accessible is the EIB. And, I'd like to uh, s say that the answer is certainly two out of three, yes. The third one, I think uh, we can uh, talk a little bit about. It, it's certainly cheap. I mean, um, Janos was talking about uh, how the EIB in a unique uh, way, which is actually, I don't know if you remember, but at a certain point, Barack Obama wanted to uh, study the uh, EIB model and implement it in the United States. Basically, we finance ourselves on the international market and we benefit from having triple a status which means that we that our sources of financing are the lowest and cheapest possible in the entire world and we don't maximize profits profit we like to turn a profit of course but this profit is not maximized that means that we pass the triple a advantage the triple a price to the client and uh, of course, there's a little bit markup for the uh, sort of uh, project preparation costs, but uh, it, it, it's really it's really cheap finance compared to what is available, even in these days of, of cheap credit. It is long term, 20, 25 years, depending on the, the sort of economic life of the project. Um, it is sometimes blended. We like, when possible, to blend this uh, sort of uh, accessible and, uh, and, and, and good terms loan with grant finance from the European Union to, do, to prepare packages that are even more, uh, more, more accessible. We're certainly large. Uh, as Jano said, um, three times as big as World Bank, um, 60, 65 billion euros of new loans every year, et cetera, et cetera. Um, projects can also be quite large. A 500 million euros loan is not uncommon. We gave 1.8 billion uh, to Athens uh, Metro of financing you know, over the years, of course. 
Now, is it accessible? I think that's where uh, we have to do a little bit of uh, uh, better work. I mean, we, of course, are a large institution. So bureaucracy is, uh, is present for sure. And uh, we have a lot of uh, scrutiny, a lot of scrutinies internally and externally. So because we finance projects for the merit of the projects, we have to be absolutely sure that these are good projects that we finance. We don't finance just any project, of course. Uh, but we have to do a better job to, I think, become accessible, especially with SMEs, uh, especially with corporations, especially project finance, corporate finance. Um, and um, I think that that's, uh, that, that, that's an area to, to improve. Maybe a, a last question or one question before the last one. I saw in one of your slides uh, explaining uh, how large was your presence in Greece. It was a, a very, very useful and interesting, interesting presence during the crisis years. But now we are facing the, this new, this novel situation, this peculiar situation of the next generation EU, which has uh, part of, uh, a large part as a percentage of loan component. Do you think you will blend, the EIB will blend well in the overall package of things that are going to be financed through this instrument. And also, we've seen the Greek uh, Minister for uh, Energy discussing his future hopes. Have you already done preparation groundwork in order to be ready to, under the time constraints that are quite acute in this respect, in order to be useful on time for Greece? If I may, I, I'll start in, in trying to answer this. I mean, obviously, the, the situation is a bit in flux, right? I mean, the, the uh, amounts um, that are being discussed between the member states, i.e. the Council, uh, the Commission and, and, and the Parliament are changing from not day to day, but certainly from week to week. So we find it a bit difficult, I have to say, internally to know exactly what amounts we're talking about and what ro our role will be. To just give you one example, we will for sure have an, a role to play in the Just Transition Fund. But whether that's going to be 17 or 18 billion or, or nearly 60 billion, uh, plays a big role in what we can do or can't do then if we align ourselves with this. So to some extent, we'll still need to wait for the uh, conclusion of this trilogue. Um, but of course, discussions are ongoing uh, all the time between the Commission, Member States and us on where we can best support various efforts. And clearly, there will be some overlap also in some areas where the Commission is now suddenly available to hand out loans to member states and, and then public sector entities, for example, and where we are available to do the same. But this can be complementary. It can be a substitute if there's reasons for that, but can also be complementary. Uh, and in many ways, of course, um, the Commission is starting afresh um, as a lender, if you so wish, whereas we've been doing this for 60 years now. So in a sense, um, a lot of the things uh, that we know how to do, um, the Commission actually looks at us and asks us for, for our active support. So you'll probably see us more often than before arriving as a team, in, in a sense, or at least one involving the other at some stage. Um, just yesterday, I got a call with someone from uh, the European Commission thinking about greening islands, by the way, in Greece. Um, and the obvious question was whether we would be willing as EIB um, to support in that endeavor the Commission, which will be having additional funds available, and we can complement that with loans, for example. Um, so I think the answer is uh, we're not competitors. We're in all likelihood going to work together more than in the past. Uh, by the way, and just to put this into perspective, the the challenge is just so big in terms of getting from 2020 with still, uh, you know, economies mostly reliant on fossil fuels to economies in 2030 much less reliant on fossil fuels, that every euro that member states can get their hands on from wherever will be a big help. And, and in that sense, we couldn't do it alone in any case. So it's very good that the Commission is now mobilizing significant funds also for this. 
can translate that into a pray and hope for the best or something close to that. I'm advised. We'll try very hard. I wouldn't even say prayer is needed, but efforts are needed. Efforts are needed. I am advised that we just have some seconds available, so I would like to turn myself now to Andrea for a final comment and then thank the both of you. Andrea? Well, perhaps um, I'd like to say that uh, I think it's a year ago that Mitsotakis, uh, Prime Minister Mitsotakis, uh, uh, launched a, a challenge for Greece, right? Uh, he said uh, we um, are closing uh, coal and lignite power plants, but he also said we need to increase uh, renewable energy in Greece by, um, what was it, 30, 35 percent. Um, and um, I think it's presently around 29, 30 percent, so that 5 percent will be a challenge. Um, so what I think Greece needs to do is to uh, commission larger projects, uh, sort of move out of the small project uh, model and move out to programs or projects or larger renewable energy projects that are easier to procure in bulk, number one. And number two, improve and the, um, uh, what is it? Uh, yeah, in, 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 in improve the, uh, the, 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 the ability of uh, independent power producers to uh, access these um, these projects by reducing bureaucracy and simplifying procedures for permits. That's very important if you if Greece wants to achieve its uh, thirty five percent renewable energy target. So thank you, thank you for your final comment too, Andrea. Thank you, Andrea. Thank you, Janos. Thank you, all of you. And now for the next panel. Bye. Thank you very much, Antonis. Good evening thank to everyone. Much, bye bye. Good evening.